has been a pleasure to be here to be encouraged and challenged from your word, be blessed by the fellowship of other like-minded saints who love you and want to live their lives for you. It's just awesome to be around your people. Well, we pray that as we talk about this uh, sensitive and pertinent topic today, that you would give us insight and wisdom and, and grace and sensitivity, and the ability to bring your scripture to bear on, on cultural issues that are impacting our society today. We commit our time to you in the wonderful, worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Susie was a pretty typical homeschooled conservative girl at our church. And the names have been changed to protect the innocent because there's some people from my church here. Uh, she came into our high school group as a freshman and was, like many young girls that we saw, very idealistic and very sweet and very innocent. And one thing I remember about Susie was that she was an aspiring author. She was very creative and she loved to write. And so she was telling my wife and I about a story that she was writing. And it turned out that uh, she, of course, was in the story. And uh, one of the young men in the high school group, unbeknownst to him, uh, was the hero of the story because she had a crush on him. And again, as a, as a freshman girl in high school, very typical thing going on. And so I just remember over the year kind of talking to her about her life and just her, her relationship with the Lord. And again, she seemed to be very engaged in the things of the scriptures and, and loved the Lord and loved his word. Really enjoyed, in fact, I think she was studying Latin because she wanted to better understand Greek. And so she was just really a fine young lady. 14-year-old girl. Fast forward two years to a camping trip that she was on with her family and several other families that they knew, other believers. And it turned out at the time that it was a very cold uh, evening and all the kids were in one tent and all the adults were in their separate tents. And she got really cold. And so she turned to her now 16, 17 year old friend and, and said, hey, can we cuddle? And they did. And they kept warm, which was appropriate for the, the, the environment. But it aroused in her something that she hadn't felt before. As time went on, her relationship with this friend began to become inquisitive. And this infatuation with romance that she had as a freshman girl was actualized two years later with a senior girl. And I saw and experienced over the next several years tragic and terrible change in life. She went from an idealistic, sweet, innocent young girl with normal fantasies about romance to a girl in turmoil. To a girl who didn't know who she was. To a girl who turned to self-harm, cutting Suicide watch, running away from home, ending up living with her girlfriend, changing her identity, and walking away from the world. Sadly, this story is not uncommon in our society today, in our churches today. And I think what we're facing is an identity crisis. And it's, it's coming in the form of a gender crisis. I'm originally from California, and that's the picture on your right of a, a gay parade, gay pride parade in San Francisco. It's moved from the gay agenda, the bisexual agenda, to the transgender agenda, and it's 
unfortunately becoming more and more common in our society today. And young people in and outside the church are asking themselves the question, who am I? And that's a question that has been asked for, honestly, centuries. But now there are so many more options. And people aren't just wondering about psychologically and intellectually who they are. They're starting to question, am I the right gender? And this is, I believe, uh, one, of, one of Satan's most recent attempts to subvert the authority of God in our lives. And so what do we do about it? How many of you in this room have somebody in your life that you know who would consider themselves transgender? Show of hands. A decent amount of you. It's real. And it's something that I think, unfortunately, historically, the church has been ill-equipped to deal with. And we have, again, a generalization as a whole, put our head in the sand, tried to ignore the issue, and hope that it just goes away. We can't do that any longer. We need to do something about it because it's people that, that you know that are being impacted by this. And so I'd like to, in the next hour, lay out what I see kind of as a progression of how they've gotten to this point, and then maybe try to give some biblical foundation and practical advice as to how you, as individuals, can be a part of a solution. Certainly the church at large can do a better job, but so often, as is the case uh, with the Lord, He wants to use you, and He wants to use me. And we can be equipped. We don't have to say, well, I'm not an expert, I'm not a professional, I'm not an elder, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a leader. If you're a Christian, God can use you in this fight, and He wants to. And so my goal at the end of the day is that you can say, I'm gonna go help Susie, John, Ben, Becky, that person that you know, or maybe you haven't met yet, but you soon will, that needs the love of the Lord to help them understand who they are and their identity in Christ. And so this, at the beginning part of this, I have to admit, maybe a little academic, because I need to lay some foundation in terms of definitions so you can understand kind of what we're actually talking about when this issue of gender uh, is addressed. <coughs> So I want to define a few terms for you, including the word gender. You can see there it says either the male or the female division of a species, especially as differentiated by social and cultural roles and behavior, for example, the feminine gender. A similar category of human beings that is outside the male-female binary classification and is based on the individual's personal awareness or identity. And I'll mention this several times, and you'll see it in, in many of the definitions in the slides, identity. How do I identify myself? Who am I? And you're going to see that time and time again, and it's very important to understand that distinction. Gender identity. One's innermost concept of self as male, female, a blend of both or neither how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. One's gender identity can be the same or different from their sex assigned at birth. You'll notice that term coming up again over and over also, assigned at birth. That's going to be interesting for us to consider. And also I'll point out in a minute, but just let me give you a little foreshadowing. The term gender and the term sex are different. And we want to look at those in just a moment. So gender identity, who am I? How do I perceive myself? And that comes out in gender expression. Okay, the external appearance of one's gender identity usually expressed through behavior, clothing, haircut, voice, and which may or may not conform to socially defined behaviors and characteristics typical associated with being either masculine or feminine. So again, they're, they're setting this construct of of masculinity and femininity is more of a social thing, and we need to be willing to maybe express ourselves differently than what society is expecting.
expecting of us. And so that's what's uh, being pushed and, and championed, particularly among our young people. So gender expression, what does that look like? I tried to make these as unoffensive as possible, but this is a, a phenomenon known as the femboy movement. Have you, have you guys heard of that one, femboy? Okay, so not as, as common or as popular or as known these days, but it's, it's a really a, a subculture that's growing in popularity and in, in notoriety. And, in, and basically all these pictures are of males uh, and they dress up as girls. And at the beginning anyway, that's all they do. It's not that they're acting out, it's not that they're saying that they're homosexual, it's just that they prefer girls' dresses or girls' clothing and like to dress up and kind of look cute. You know, and in, in the right culture, I guess, uh, in, the, in a pulp culture in Scotland, the guy with the red hair could be a bagpipe player. You know, I don't know. Uh, but it's a, it's a phenomenon that um, is occurring primarily among young, uh, and it's something that, again, most of them wasn't even aware of it. Again, unfortunately, I uh, came to our attention because one of the young people in our church, uh, his mom, being a, a troll mom, uh, found his Facebook page and saw that he was posing this way on Facebook under a different identity. Uh, it's happening in the church. And people are expressing themselves about how they feel in just kind of an awareness of what's going on. Kind of all this, this gender crisis, as I called it, falls under a big umbrella term called transgender. And this is a really weird definition, <coughs> but it's, it's their definition. It's an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and or expression is different from cultural expectations, you saw that earlier, based on the sex which they were assigned at birth. We saw that again earlier as well. Being transgender, this is what's odd to me, does not apply any sexual orientation. Therefore, transgender people may identify as straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, etc. So if you're in this room and you identify yourself as straight, which would be guys liking girls and girls liking guys, then apparently you're transgender. Did you realize that? Take that one home to your assembly. <laughs> this has led in many ways to another interesting term, and this is more of a psychological term, but it's called gender dysphoria. And just so you know, that word dysphoria um, means a general dissatisfaction. Okay, that's what, just what that word means. A general dissatisfaction with life. So now when I add gender to the equation, basically what it's saying is I'm not satisfied with my gender. Okay, and so, this is actually a clinical term, again, used in the psychology world, and uh, whatever you feel about psychology, we can talk about that later. But it's uh, a significant distress caused when a person's assigned birth gender is not the same as the one with which they identify. According to the American Psychiatric Association, so that's kind of the, the governing body for the psychiatric world, they have this, uh, and for lack of a better term, I call it their Bible. It is the a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, commonly known as the DSM. And so that is where it's a big old thick thing where it's got all of the disorders, mental disorders, listed. Okay, and they de define gender dysphoria. Interestingly enough, the term used to be gender identity disorder. Disorder means a mental or physical illness that is not normal. And so you can see how in 2013, the mindset of our society is shifting. We're not, no longer gonna call it a sickness, we're gonna call it a distress, a dysfunction, a dysphoria, a dissatisfaction. And so we're, we're softening the implication of what it means to question your identity. And again, we being the psychological world. How big of a problem is this? Well, back in 2012, uh, surveys said that 3.5% of the U.S. population would consider themselves transgender. Ten years later, that number is up to 
7%. So it's doubled in 10 years. Interesting that 6 to 7% of the population is getting so much publicity, so much press, so much attention, so much significance. Why is that? Because it's an issue of identity. Who am I? Who are we as a people? Who are we as a nation? And it's making the news. Interestingly enough, again, this is more of a young person's issue. As you look at the, the different uh, generational denominations as we were, we were talking about Gen Z and X and all that, um, the older the group, the less percentage would identify uh, as transgender. The, the highest, as you would imagine, is the Gen Z, and 16% of the Gen Z population claims to be transgender. So almost one in five people of our younger generation these days would identify as transgender. The fastest growing group, middle school girls. And if you think about it for a minute, what's going on in the mind of a middle school girl? Having had one, I, I still can't imagine what was going on in her mind, but it's a lot of confusion. Who am I? Do I fit in, and where do I fit in? And so we see this, and, and, and this is a, I think this is a God thing. We're made for relationship. We're made to be part of relationship, primarily with God, secondly with family, third with our church community, to our broader community. And so when people don't fit in, they look for somewhere to fit in. So you might identify as an Argentina soccer fan this week. Maybe in a couple of months, you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan because they're winning the Super Bowl. Perhaps you're a Dallas Stars fan or a I don't know, Imagine Dragons fan. I'm picking a band. I don't even know if you guys know who they are. Um, but it's, we want to identify with other people as I can relate. One of the reasons that gangs are so significant is because people who are drifters, who have no identity in life, can be part of something. All you have to do is go rob this liquor store and you'll be in with us. And people strive and yearn and long for identity. And so if the cool kids are transgender, I'll do that. And so you're seeing this mass movement in middle school girls to claim that that's what they want to be. Again, I mentioned the term, I think it's gender confusion. Back in the 70s, it started off with the gay rights movement. And I, let me just commend you, and in, my, in my last slide I have a list of resources that I've used to prepare for this, and one of them is a book called We Cannot Be Silent by Albert Moeller. And it's really fascinating how, again, as I mentioned, the church has had her head in the sand for a lot of years. This movement didn't just pop up last month. This agenda, and again, I think satanically driven, has been going on for many, many years. And so if you look back, again, you can look at society. In the 70s, we had the gay rights movement. And again, in, in San Francisco, we had Harvey Milk and all the issues around that situation. In the 80s, when I was in high school, there was a club called the Gala Club, Gay and Lesbian Alliance. And so now it's expanded to, it's not just gay guys, which was the first focus, but now there's girls involved, with lesbians. And then you, you move on to the 90s, and you had the, the lesbian, gay, bisexual movement. And so now you could be both, not just either or. Um, maybe the 2000s is when we added the, the T, transgender. And it just gets more and more and more confusion. What do we have today? LGBTQ2IA. I need a nap. What are they talking about? It's so confusing. Quilt bag. And again, you look at these things. Queer, questioning, undecided, intersex, lesbian, transgender, transsexual, bisexual, allied, asexual, gay, genderqueer. 
And it gets worse. Depending on the, the sources that you want to use, I found between 68 and 112 genders that you can choose from today. Where does it stop? Who am I? And now the term that honestly is most popular is gender fluidity. And so you can move in and out of these 112 categories at will. And so you may feel attracted to, or identifying, not even attracted to, that's a different issue. Um, I want to be, and again, I, 112, what can you be? It's just, it's crazy. And, you know, I'm a, a reasoning, and I think reasonable, adult. And this is hard to, to, to kind of capture. Imagine being a seven-year-old child, or even worse, a four-year-old. Anybody know what Blue's Clues is? Anybody know that show? Okay. Who's the audience of Blue's Clues? Three, four, five-year-olds? Okay, well, they, we showed a video at our, our college group a few years ago where it was Pride Week. And Blue's Clues had, I think it was a seven minute thing on the parade. And they showed all these, you know, kind of animals and weird, but they're like two boy elephants are, are you know, loving each other and, and then two girl out. And the whole thing, it was, and it was a cute song and they kept repeating the song over about love and love and love and it's all about love. In the seven-minute video, there were no male, female. It was all same sex. To an audience of what? Three, four, and five-year-olds? What chance do they have? Mommy, who am I? And then you take into account the, the fact that many of these children come from unsaved homes, broken homes, parents are out and the, the TV is their babysitter. Who am I? It's tragic what's going on. There's an identity crisis of unparalleled proportion that is assaulting our society. So I mentioned gender, gender confusion, gender dysphoria, gender transition. But that's different than sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is the enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, and sexual attraction to man, women, or both. Sexual orientation also refers to a person's sense of identity, again, that term, based on those attractions, related behaviors, and membership in a community of others who share those attractions. Again, that idea of community and belonging. I want to orient towards a certain group of people. Whereas gender identity would be, who do I want to go to bed as? Who am I? How do I identify? Sexual orientation would be, who do I want to go to bed with? Okay, who are you attracted to? Slight difference, but I just want to make that clear. All of this confusion, again, has led to gender transition, whereby people are trying to more closely align how they feel, their internal knowledge, with their outward appearance. I showed you the femboys, that's one aspect, and, and again, in some ways, a very minor part of what's going on in our society. Others are worse. Um, been involved in, in campus ministry for a lot of years, and I remember a guy that used to come to, we have a, a Sunday night soccer ministry in the summer where we just play soccer and guys come out and people invite their friends, it's very easy. And there was a guy that was coming named Robbie, uh, Everton soccer club fan, if you care. And uh, he was, he was great. I mean, and he, he played really hard and too aggressively. We had to tell him to settle down a few times. Um, kind of a, a man's man, if you will. And then uh, summer ended and, and college started. And I saw him, I think it was maybe September or October, I saw him in the, in the cafeteria at school. And he looked a little different. And I, I, I think I recognized him and said, hey, Robin, what's going on? And he said, well, I'm transitioning. And I was like, what do you mean, in between classes? I mean, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, no, I'm becoming a girl. And I was 
was like, oh, well, what's that look like? And he said, well, I just came from PE, so it's a little different, but normally you would see me with lipstick and, and uh, you know, a dress and uh, nylons, and I'm just, I'm trying to express how I feel about myself as a human. And I, I kind of lost track of him after that. I'm, again, kind of how the church has handled this. He said, would it be okay if I still come to soccer? I said, of course. Why would you not come to soccer? Well, my dad said that, you know, the church is against this and I, you know, I'm going to get kicked out of the church. Well, we're playing soccer. But that stigma and that fear scared him away from even coming to play soccer with somebody that called himself a believer. There's something wrong with it. And insert, and I'll insert this 15 times before I'm done. I am very much against sin. I do not like, condone, uh, appreciate, or favor sin in any way. So as I'm talking about how we address the transgender community, please do not misunderstand the fact that I am pro-sin. I hate sin, as does the Lord Jesus. But... The way you approach people and the way you show the love of Jesus can be very different and have a huge impact. So I lost track with Robbie mostly because of his guilt, not because we shunned him. So I don't know where he went. There's somebody else that again used to be in, in our high school class 100 years ago um, who went further. Moved out of state, um, began a relationship began a relationship with a guy, decided that wasn't right, decided to change it to a girl, then became transgender, came back to San Francisco to get a gender reorientation surgery to become a guy, and then married a guy. Gender dysphoria. Somebody who grew up in the assemblies, whose grandparents are what we would call kind of like major players in the international um, missionary world. It's not the broken home, single parent household that this has happened to exclusively. I was reading this week about a, a person who had 32 plastic surgeries, spent $300,000 so that they could look like a Korean woman. In the process, they came to know Jesus and said it was the most horrible realization of their life that they wasted so much time and money trying to find out who they were when all they had to do was open the Bible and it was free. This is impacting lives, and we can do something about it. It's a crisis, and I hope that's obvious from some of the facts that I've shown you. But I think we need to look at the Bible and say, are there answers for us in this discussion? And I think there are, and so if you do have a Bible, you can feel free to turn to Genesis 1. It's a passage that I'm sure you're familiar with, and it's very simple. And that's what's amazing about this, and what's sad, is we are intimidated and afraid to address some of these issues, but really, they're not that difficult. There's really, and I don't want to be oversimplistic, but there's God's way, and there's not God's way, and that's it. And so, if anything is not God's way, all we need to do is point people to God's way. We don't need to know all the ins and outs of all the details and all of the, the implications of what people are into. If we know the right way, that's what they need to know. On this issue, there are some specific things, including Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. 
male and female, he created them. And so again, it, it's pretty simple and, and hopefully not too simplistic, but God created male and female. And that's his design. And ultimately, this, that's what this is going to get down to. It's, it's going to be, it's an attack on God. And that's why I say it's satanically influenced, because it's an attack on God and his character and his design. And so, <coughs> I want to give you a couple more definitions to help flesh this out. And again, I, I hesitate to bring this up in a church setting, but I want to talk about sex. I'm going to talk about the noun, not the verb, so hopefully that uh, keeps it PG. But sex means either the male or the female division of species, especially as differentiated with reference to the reproductive functions. So we're talking about functionality. In the sum of the structural function and differences by which the male and the female are distinguished, or the phenomena or behavior dependent on those differences. Very technical, very biological, very functional, but that's what the noun sex means. Then you get a little bit of a, a nuance, the instinct or attraction drawing one sex towards another, or its manifestation in life and conduct. So that's maybe where it's leaning towards sexual attraction just a bit. Specifically then looking at the male and female, again, notice the, the difference in the definitions of gender versus sex. Okay. Of or denoting the sex that produces small, typically modal gametes, especially spermatozoa, with which the female may be fertilized or inseminated to produce offspring. Anything related to feelings, identity, looking inside of oneself? The sex that can bear offspring or produce eggs, distinguished biologically by the production of gametes or ova, which can be fertilized by the male gametes. Okay. That's the definition of male and female, which God established in the beginning. Gender identity, one's innermost concept of self as male, female, a blend of both or neither. How an individual perceive themselves and what they call themselves. Their gender can be different from their sex assigned at birth. Who's making those assignments? God. So, again, trying to be biblical about this, I, I, I tried to, to look up the, the term gender in the Bible. I couldn't find it. Zero references to the term gender. I looked up male and female, over 300 occurrences. And that's just male, female, not men, women, etc. So there's hundreds of references to what God designed. What is gender? I would submit that it's a social construct that man has generated, motivated by Satan himself, to confuse society and get people to challenge God's design. Gender is not a biblical term. Moving on in Genesis, the Lord said, in the following verse, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And the Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said to him, this is not bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And she was taken out of man. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So there's a beautiful aspect of marriage, which is another seminar. Um, but one of the aspects that, that really is, is prominent here is the idea of becoming one flesh and that union and the idea of <coughs> procreation, which God goes on to talk about as he challenges man in the garden. And so what is happening when biologically compatible people are, are not together, man is trying to become God because in order to procreate, we're, we're making test tube babies and artificial this and, and scientifically produced that. And really what's happening is, is God is trying to be taken out of the creative process. And so that's why I say this is an attack on God's design for mankind. Speaking of the same subject in, in the New Testament, Ephesians 5, again, another decently long passage on marriage, just to, to give you the context, you see, you see their husbands love your wives the rest of the church. Again, you're probably familiar with the rest. But the last couple lines, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, 
leaves his wife and the two shall become one flesh. We just read that. The mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So this whole man, woman, male, female thing that God started back in Genesis is somehow mysteriously connected with Christ's relationship to the church. And so when we start challenging and attacking and changing the meaning of male and female and gender, we're attacking the gospel itself. And again, that's where I say that this movement is more than just the confusion of young people. It's Satan's attempt to overthrow God's created order. And it's something that we need to be aware of. And so the question is, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe our society that's 6% are screaming loud and the Christians are trying to humbly, graciously be quiet and say nothing? Or are you going to believe the word of God? Romans 9 says, on the contrary, who are you, a man, who answers back to God? What are you thinking? And it's hard for, for me to say that to another individual who's challenging God. But that's what God says. You know, you read the book of Job, and it's like, where were you when I made the morning? You ever commanded the snow? And when we think of how awesome God is and how gracious he has been to us, the audacity to challenge him and say, who are you to make me this way is so arrogant. And yet, we ponder those questions from time to time, don't we? Well, is it really that wrong? Can I be affirming as a Christian and say, well, they're not hurting anybody, it's okay? Not if you want to agree with God. And that's where I say, this is sin. And we need to recognize that. And the scripture lays this out in, in Romans chapter 1. I want to quickly look at that passage so you can see just the, the biblical precedent for what's going on here. Romans chapter 1, the section there you're probably familiar is condemnation of mankind. Starting in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. If they suppress the truth, there's God's way and not God's way. Because what is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks but became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed animals, and of crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Well, they did not. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way also, the men abandoned their natural function of the woman and burned their desire for one another, man with man committing indecent acts, and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which were not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, or gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God and those who practice those things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And so you just see this horrible indictment of mankind, suppressing God's truth, ignoring God's revelation, perverting God's glory. And so what does God do? He gives them over. He gives them over to impurity, to degrading passions, 
to a depraved mind. And I saw a bit of a correlation here, and, and honestly stole this from John MacArthur a few years ago, but he sees this trend as the sexual revolution giving way to the homosexual revolution evolving to the transgender revolution. And if you look at, <coughs> you see it pretty clearly where it talks about, you know, the, the men and women uh, giving up their natural passions and, and burning for one another. That's very obviously homosexuality. But when you look at the list in, in 28 to, to 32, there's all kinds of things in there. The thing that really is interesting to me, one, it's under a depraved mind. It's just people are just so confused and so wicked. The one little phrase, inventors of evil. It's like they're making stuff up. And that's where, again, 112 genders, it's just, it's crazy. It's people just making stuff up to defy God, to rebel against him. And it's, it's God's judgment. And he's basically getting out of the way and saying, if that's what you want, it's a really slippery slope. And it's God's wrath. And so how do we respond? Or maybe more appropriately, how have we responded as a church? Famous passage in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor adulterers, idolaters, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, nor violers, nor swindlers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And we say, Amen. Sinners deserve to go to hell. And especially the effeminate and the homosexuals and the transgender. Keep them away from me. Keep them away from my kids. Keep them away from our church. What we're really saying is keep them away from our Lord. And that's when we made a mistake. Sin is sin. But read the next verse. And such are some of you. There's hope in Jesus Christ. And these sinners that deserve to rot in hell, these confused transgender people, are people. Some of them are in your assembly. Some of them may be in your row right now. And we need to recognize that it's not just some person, it's a person. 34% of people who identify as transgender have attempted suicide. 73% of people who identify as transgender have been verbally abused in public. 62% have been physically bullied in some way. And 21%, one out of five people who identify as transgender are afraid to leave their home. When there's statistics, it's just a number. But those of you who raised your hand, can you identify with the pain, the uncertainty, the fear that your friends are, are experiencing? They need Jesus. And we need to respond as such. A few examples of the Lord himself, and we won't turn to these passages because of time, but I commend them to your study. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus is in the house of the Pharisee, and they're condemning him for doing what? Eating with tax gatherers and sinners. Who do you spend time with? I remember doing a, an, an evangelism series with our high school group and gave a kind of a, a homework assignment. Okay, go this week and just talk to an unsafe friend. Okay, because the hardest part is starting a conversation. You don't need to worry about all the gospel verses. Just start a conversation. So we came back to the next week and 
we had a class of, I don't know, there's probably 15 or 16 people that day, and there was two people that didn't answer. I said, what's the deal? And they said, we don't know any unsaved people. That's wrong. We want to protect our kids from the world, I get it. But if you don't know any unsaved people, what are you doing on earth? You can be great worshipers, and, and God honors that, and I praise the Lord for, for your worship time. But if you have no influence on this unsaved world, you are absolutely missing out on what God wants from you here on this planet. God dined with tax gatherers and sinners. Am I better than him? Oh, but I'm, I'm holy. I think he was pretty holy. John 8, woman caught in adultery. She was guilty. She knew it. It says Jesus did not condemn her. Now he said, go and sin no more. So again, sin is not okay. But what was the attitude with which he approached a repentant sinner? It wasn't condemnation. It was mercy. Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. Again, we all know it. When he came to his senses, and he repented, he did business with God, and he turned, he repented, and he came back to the Father. And what did the Father do? Shun him? Ignore him? Scold him? He girded up his robe, and he ran, and he embraced him. When sinners walk into our assembly, how do we treat them? When the person comes to your college Bible study and says, what bathroom can I use tonight? What do you say? Luke 19, again, the story is, is similar. The Lord dealing with sinners, and at the end it says, he came to seek and to save. Unfortunately, so often today, our church is looking to run and to hide from those who are lost. Ignore them and shun them and keep them away from us. Keep our, our halls hollowed and holy and sacred. And we wonder why the transgender community is afraid of the church. If there's one place on the planet that a marginalized, confused, scared sinner should feel love and acceptance, it's in the church. And again, not that that's where we want them to stay as people, but you have to win the hearing. And if we shun them immediately, we're losing that opportunity. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. In our last few minutes, I just want to look at a couple of verses that hopefully can give you some practical helps, things that you can do. <coughs> John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we want to lead with grace. The truth is there. You never want to compromise the gospel message. But lead with grace. Let people know that there's love at the cross. There was pain, there was suffering, there was sacrifice. But it was because of grace. Practice kindness, Romans 2, 4 says, If you not know that the kindness of the Lord leads to repentance. There's a verse above my wall growing up is guilt leads to repentance. Guilt tripping is the way to get people to do what you want them to do. Boy, we've adopted that too, too often in our lives. The kindness of the Lord leads to repentance. We need to listen with compassion. It's, it's difficult when, when, you, when you're a fixer, when you want to help people, when you, want to, when you want to solve their problems. And so oftentimes when people start to talk, you already are formulating the answer. And you know what? In the first 10 minutes of the conversation, they may not need an answer. 
They may need a tear. They may need a hug. They may need a shoulder to cry on. Listen to people's stories. Number one, it helps you to get an understanding of, of what's going on in their heart. Those, again, we're on Texas Tech campus a lot these days, and I met a girl last year. Well, I think it was a girl, and I don't say that facetiously. Um, we talked to her for 45 minutes or so this one day, and we talked about different uh, clubs on campus and different experiences she had had with Christianity and had grown up in the church, which is often the case, unfortunately. Um, and after about 30 minutes, she said, okay, so when are you going to try to convert me? I said, what are you talking about? I told you when we started the conversation, we were trying to get a feel for people's spiritual condition on campus and how you view life. That's what we said we're going to do. That's what we're doing. But yeah, but I know there's a catch. There's not a catch. I want to understand your perspective and your philosophy of life. And so we went on, and then another group came up, and she goes, oh, yeah, well, they did this, and they did this, and so I know that's what we're going to do. We just want to listen. We just want to hear. And that's what we're facing. There, there's such a stigma, and unfortunately justified, that Christians are going to condemn me and try to convert me. And in a weird way, I mean, that's our goal is to convert them, to bring them to Jesus. But we need to do something different in our approach because it's not working. Listen to what people are trying to say. Be consistent in our stance towards sin. We have a tendency to rank sin. And so cheating on tests in school is becoming more and more acceptable, I guess, common and popular. That's not that bad of a deal. Everybody's doing it. Um, lying, as long as it's not like a big lie, and I know it's a big lie versus a small lie, I guess you've got to get the scale on that one. Um, exaggerating. Um, you know, occasional outbursts of anger. You know, I mean, I'm Irish. That's, that's what I do. You know, I'm an, I'm an angry guy. Uh, or um, another good one for an Irish is, oh, he's got a weak problem with the drink. Um, you know, I occasionally get drunk. Um, homosexuality. Whoa, now we're talking sin. Okay, sin is sin. Now, consequences are different, and, and, I, and that's another seminar. But we over-exaggerate some sins and under-exaggerate under others. And so when we make homosexuality and transgender and, and bisexuality and those things like the unpardonable sin, we're not being fair. So call sin, sin, but call it equally. Don't be afraid to talk about those things publicly. But we want to preach hope in Christ. Romans 15, 13 says it. God is a God of hope, the God of all hope. And as I mentioned, one third of people who struggle with this confusion have tried to commit suicide. The opposite of hope is despair. And that's when people try to take their lives. And so the people that are struggling with this issue need hope. And who's got hope? We need to share that. We need to preach it boldly. We need to speak the truth in love. Hey, we got to tell the truth. You can't just let somebody come into your assembly and love them and, and welcome them and let them live in that condition for years. Okay, it's not good for them. What's good for them is Jesus. So we need to tell them the truth, but it needs to be done in a loving way or they're not going to listen. We need to be humble. Galatians 6 1 says, You who are spiritual, uh, if any man has caught in any trespass, Restore him in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourselves, lest you too be tempted. And so again, I don't know a lot of you in this room, but I can say with confidence that all of us are half an hour from destroying our testimony. Okay, there is nobody that's beyond sin. And so when you're condemning somebody else, be careful. I think we heard on night one, um, pride comes before destruction. We need to be humble as we approach people who have a great need, because certainly we did too. We need to be known for good works. 
Rosario Butterfield, who's a, a very prominent uh, ex-lesbian who came out of that community, um, was won to Christ by an invitation to dinner. And another one. And another one. And a house key to her neighbor's house. He said, anytime you need a place to come, feel free to come and hang out here. And as she experienced that love and the good works of somebody who cared for her in practical ways, she realized that the lifestyle, the community that she was seeking out was not fulfilling. But somebody who showed her practical love won her to Jesus. And then be merciful. Uh, read 1 Timothy um, 1, 18 to, 7, uh, 8 to 17. It's awesome. It talks about Paul and the fact that he talks about the law and the laws for sinners and, and the unrighteous and blah, blah, blah. And then he says, but you know what? That's the way I was. But I acted in ignorance. And the Lord showed me mercy. And so many of these people, again, especially the young ones, are ignorant. They're being taught by their blues clues and their preschool teachers and their library times and the books they're reading in school that this is what's right and this is what's normal and this is what they should be exploring. And they don't know any better. They're acting in ignorance and we need to show them mercy and show them the love of the Lord as we do that. And finally, just a couple of uh, practical things, maybe more for church leaders. Um, promote community. Look for ways to include people, not exclude them. And I'm not saying, you know, a person comes in and they're struggling with, with this issue and you say, okay, well, you can preach next week. But they can serve snacks. You know, they can help out on the chapel work day. We don't need to be exclusive. We need to bring people in. I mean, these two people I know in our assembly are there because they came to a work day. And they said, I met people that loved me. And I felt like, wow, I can be a part of this community. So in, look for ways to include people, even those that are struggling with sin. Show hospitality, I mentioned that with Rosario. Um, open your home. Rosario Butterfield, I mentioned her again, she wrote a book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. You know, and just the idea of having an atmosphere in your home where people are welcome. Be those kind of people. Be sensitive to single people. This is a tough one. We have, again, I'll probably step on a few toes here, but we have made marriage an idol in the Christian church. And marriage is a wonderful thing and it's an institution by God. And he said, it's not good for men to be alone and not make a woman. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful. I'm happily married. But it's not the only option. The most godly, incredible evangelist, pastor, shepherd, savior that I know was a single man. And we need to be careful that we don't make single people second class citizens because that fosters that type of pressure that then causes them to look for acceptance and love they may not find in the opposite sex. Stay up to date with social trends. Okay, don't be caught off guard by fanboys. And this is hard because you can't know everything, but boy, we need to be aware of what's going on in our society, especially if you're a leader in the church. Um, you know, I'm on Facebook, and it's not, I mean, I do waste more time on there than I should, but I know what's going on in the young people's lives because I hear these stupid phrases, I don't know what they mean, so I ask. You have to be aware of what's going on or you're gonna be blindsided, and you're gonna be ignorant, and you're gonna be afraid. And we don't have to be afraid if we're clued into what's going on. But we wanna have a gospel-centered message of identity. It's an identity crisis that people are struggling with. And if we can show them how beautiful it is to be identified as Christ, to be accepted in the beloved, as Brady was talking about the other night with the young people, that that's the community, that's the love, that's the fellowship, that's the relationship that you need. The other things aren't as significant, and it makes it easier. But again, there are people that I've talked to that say, I've prayed and prayed and prayed that God would help, help me be attracted to women, but I'm not. And so they know that it's wrong to pursue a same-sex relationship, but they feel stuck. Help them to identify as a Christian, not as a gay, celibate Christian. I think that's a terminology that's getting thrown around a lot today. But I'm a believer, a child of God. 
and that's my identity, and focus on the gospel and that, and not the other things. And then don't be afraid to publicly talk about these issues. And even in your homes, you know, we, we had a, a seminar on pornography five or six years ago now, and there was a man in the audience that said, hey, I have an 11-year-old son. Um, when should I start talking to him about this issue? And the speaker said, How about three years ago. We're so, and again, I respect parents to the max. Parenting is hard. Um, and we try to protect our kids as much as possible. We think, well, if we don't talk about it, it, it won't happen. Well, it's happening. Blues, clues, um, Bible, or a library readings. I mean, kids are getting exposed. And so you want them to hear it from you. You want them to have a biblical, Christ-centered perspective. And so bring these things up in your homes, in your Sunday school rooms, in your, in your teen groups. Talk about the issues and, and listen. Listen with compassion. Because again, there are people in your church that are struggling with this, I can guarantee it. There's a book that I love. It's called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. And it's talking about the fact that every one of us can be an instrument that the great physician can use to change lives. You don't have to be a church leader. You don't have to be an expert in this area. You just have to be willing to be used by God, to be a channel of his love and his grace. And you want to know a few things, but it's simple. God's way or not God's way. And if you can show love and grace and compassion to people who struggle with this gender identity, help them recognize that an identity in Christ is so much more beautiful. And if you're a believer, you have that. And that's all you need to know. And share that with them and be an instrument that can be used for God's glory. Lord, it's so wonderful to be identified with you, to know that we are accepted in the beloved, and that's all that we need. Lord, as people struggle with wanting to be loved, wanting to have a relationship, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be part of a group and a community, I pray that they would find that in us, whether it be in our churches or in our homes or our fellowships, in our Christian clubs on campus. Lord, help us to be people that are approachable for those who are confused, those who are struggling, those who are shunned by society. Help us to be people of grace who radiate the love of Jesus. Lord, help us not to compromise on the truth. Help us to speak it in love. Help us to have an impact for you. Lord, we know that Satan is on the attack and he's crafty and he's pretty good. But Lord, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And we can be used by you to reach people for Christ, even those who are completely confused about their identity and are struggling in these ways. Please give us the courage, Lord, to trust you and to reach out to our friends who we know in these predicaments. May we glorify you, Lord, in the way we do it. In Jesus' name.